This is Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. And as you can see, we have a special guest in the studio today, Donna Glover. We'll get a chance to introduce her to provide a little background on herself and just give you a little more about those that don't know Donna Glover already. But with that, I uh, also just wanted to give a shout out to Charles Bishop. He's actually under the weather. And Mike Washington uh, is playing and doing his father duties as he should. And so I'll be bringing you the show. And again, Donna G is uh, stepping up uh, to provide some commentary. And we get a chance to beautify the room, I guess, the first thing I'd say for sure. And then as well, we get a chance to get a perspective from a woman. So I'm really excited about this. We've been working on this a little while, and this was the perfect situation. Uh, as uh, I guess it's perfectly to talk about, uh, baseball season is officially over with the Houston Astros winning the World Series, so we'll congr congratulate them. And so we got Donna Glover coming in as a pinch batter to kind of give us uh, that old big swing. And obviously, as we do, we talk about HBC sports. So let me give you the official update, as we say. Welcome and thanks for joining us for the only weekly sports talk radio show that is dedicated to exploring the sporting HBC dash with its unique cultural identity, including the teams, the bands, coaches, athletic directors, uh, presidents, commissioners, classics, homecoming events, as well as the sport management business practices in the competitive sports industry. The show seeks to provide informative, progressive, and uh, innovative dialogue about the week's HBCU sporting events, issues, and ideas from a fan's perspective. We look at the Southwestern Athletic Conference, better known as the SWAC, Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, better known as the MEAC of the NCAA Division I. We look at the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, SIAC, uh, the SEAC, as many people call it, Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, the CIAA of the NCAA Division II, as well as the Gulf Coast Athletic Conference, GCAC of the NAIA and independent programs such as Tennessee State of the OVC, as well as Langston of the Central State Football League. We'll give some good news on Langston, some tough news on Tennessee State as we get going through the show. I see uh, the introduction artist that you heard, uh, which is King Tab, better known as Lawrence McCall. Tabathon, as some people would say, he's going to beat me up for that next time we see him as we get into uh, homecoming week and things of that nature. But uh, we also know him as uh, the great Tabby. He is on watching us. King Tab, appreciate that intro, the work you put in. Christopher Cro Crockett is joining us. I see you, uh, my Epsilon frat brother there, getting in there. Donna G is on as well, and she's uh, doing double duty as talk about that. Some shout out to Dwight Moore, as I see some people in there. Uh, Mike Barksdale, yes, uh, trying to get it done. Brian Barefield is in the house. Mike uh, Barksdale, as you said, I appreciate you watching all y'all chiming in. And uh, we'll give you a shout-out throughout the show. You have some questions you want to add and get some pers perspective. We'll talk about that. But before I give you the updates of the week in terms of HBCU sports uh, from that perspective, I am TJ is on as well. Let's formally introduce Donna Glover. Tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and then we'll go a chance to get a little more of your background in terms of how you got involved with sports, particularly following HBCU sports and those things, if you would, in short order. Go ahead. Sure, sure. So, first of all, good evening, everyone. Glad you all are uh, tuning in, of course, to uh, this great show and uh, the Dr. Uh, K. Cavill is on the mic representing and as he has been doing and um, just one thing before I get into myself, which is uh, just I really appreciate Dr. Cavill and his consistency. He's uh, really a great person to look up to and, and be a mentor. So if you, I know most of you all know him, but if you don't know him in a more uh, intimate setting, uh, he's a great guy to know. So, so chickens in the mail. Chickens in the mail. <laughs> thank look you. At that. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I told um, y'all. I told y'all. <laughs> He's great. So I'm Donna Glover, a.k.a. Donna G, as most people know me from uh, oh, Lamar High School and PB, you know, representing on the MIC. So um, I am, I have a, a Bachelor's of Science from the Prairie View a &M University, as well as a, um, a Master's in Education from the University of St. Thomas. Uh, most people would say I'm a world traveler, or at least a, a domestic traveler. 
uh, have lived in uh, Chicago, D.C., Nashville, and now I'm back here in H-Town representing. Good to, back, good to have you uh, back here in Prairie View. And Donna has done a lot of work with Prairie View and the University of Law, supporting in different endeavors. Uh, obviously, on the sporting side and outside of that, as well in terms of academics, all around picture. But let's go into how did you get involved with sports? Obviously, uh, we know that women follow sports and, mm -hmm. and can do it just as good as men. But people often always want to know how do you how did you get in? Uh, Where did you kind of get your break in? How are you involved in HBCU sports? So exactly just as you said, you know, I still love sports. I love HBCUs, uh, and uh, how I feel. I fell into it was basically doing some research uh, for the National Alumni Association preview and knowing that um, athletics really fund schools so when uh, you guys are, are looking to try to expand your programs uh, sometimes you gotta focus on athletics sometimes you focus on academics sometimes you can focus on both but uh, athletics really draw in uh, money for schools and so uh, they led me to kind of really focus on uh, how can we increase the athletics in Prairie View as well as here in Te uh, Houston with Texas Southern. Um, also, um, if you guys know, I am I was the former founder and president of the Chicago HBCU Alumni Associate uh, Consortium actually when I lived there and was the Chicago chapter president of oh. the Prairie View NAA. And then when I moved back here to Houston, uh, I was president of the uh, Houston HBCU Alumni Association. And so in addition to working with Prairie View and Texas Southern, I got a chance to work with Grambling and Southern, um, Morehouse. Uh, we had at least 20 um, schools that were a part of the association at that time. That was Sweet. about five years ago. Uh, but, you know, like I said, just to be able to compete um, in different capacities with other schools uh, and just within ourselves, you know, we got to get those athletic done. We have the, the uh, potential, we have the talent, whatever, so it's just been able to recruit it and also uniting amongst ourselves as alumni to give, give, give <laughs> to our universities as well as, you know, press the uh, university officials to make sure that athletics and academics are uh, important. Certainly. I think well said. When you talk about the alumni and giving uh, from that perspective, let me take you inside the window and take the listeners and followers and watchers inside the window. Obviously, many people uh, probably need to be even more, but many people are involved with their alumni associations. But you're in a neat, unique perspective in a lot of ways. You were uh, in an organization that brought alumni associations together. Right. Uh, talk about the experience of working on that and the spirit that was involved, I'm sure, with the, as we talk about athletics, the athletic banter going back and forth with key matchups and mm -hmm. people talking about past games and big games. Tell the uh, listeners a little bit more about how, how is it about working with a group of HBCUs that have a common core mm -hmm. but obviously have a love for their individual institution? So that's actually great. You know, um, again, as you mentioned, we, we came together for unity, but, you know, when it came to our individual school, we had definitely had and have much love for uh, them. And so um, we found a lot of the alumni associations kind of in the same boat, you know, as far as um, needing funds, operating funds, um, you know, alumni not really dedicated to giving, um, and, and sometimes, as I mentioned in my uh, address to, to the university, you know, it's time, talent, and treasure. So when you're young, a lot of times you don't have the treasure, but you got the time and the talent, you know. So it's like two out of three, we need you to kind of give that. So when you get older, you might have the treasure and uh, the talent, but you might not have the time. Uh, you know, so any combination of those three are really appreciated by alumni associations as well as the universities. Like yeah, and so um, again, you know, we just found a common thread in that and trying to um, work together in order to create awareness here in the Houston area about HBCUs, and, and, and it's pretty good down here. Uh, in places up north like Chicago, uh, D.C., um, Detroit, you know, they don't usually have a lot of um, 
HBCUs in their locations or even, you know, surrounding. DC, I'll, say, I'll take that back because you got Morgan State and you got uh, Bowie State. UDC kind of <laughs> in the HBCU, but sure uh, up north. See, she's showing off a little bit. See, some of y'all don't know about the University of District of Columbia as it is a Division II HBCU program, Absolutely. basically as an independent. They play some of the CIAA schools, and so Donna's already showing up. So don't worry. We're going to get into sports. I'm just touching y'all out, letting y'all know, so don't get it twisted. As well as Chicago State in uh, Chicago, you know. Um, so, you know, we've had some unfortunate things happen with them as far as uh, mm -hmm. trying to keep them open. But in, you know, California, so places like that where HBCUs are not heavily populated, you know, we want to make sure we get into those areas uh, to so that we can, you know, Great tell point. them about our um, our university. Uh, I was hate to see the, uh, what was the matchup that we had in California? Oh, the um, Los Angeles Classic, Angels Classic, when you had Prairie View, mm -hmm. North Carolina a and year, one year, and then you had Prairie View A&M and, and, and Morehouse. Yeah, one year. Another year. Mm -hmm. uh, Prairie so, View won both those games for those. Go Panthers. So, uh, um, keeping count. <laughs> but those are, all, you know, just excellent opportunities to uh, showcase our students uh, and their ability. And so, anyway, um, Again, we found just common core, common threads, uh, um, giving, um, you know, holding officials accountable. Uh, a lot of times we see with HBCUs that um, the university officials are, well, you know, kind of get away with some things that are unethical uh, and that might not have, might not usually happen at a PWI. And, you know, so I think we got to hold our boards and, um, those who are in charge of hiring these people, um, search committees, etc. You know, to really uh, get Hold the best account. people. Really? Yeah, absolutely, the best people who have the best in mind for the universities, to not just claim the paycheck and not just having the, you know an additional uh, title on their resume. Certainly, and before we get into sports, I will give an update, and then we'll get into some banner going back and forth. Our thoughts on some of these matchups as we go back and forth in regards to what are we looking at here in a lot of ways. I wanted to ask this final question because you also uh, modest in a lot of ways. You do some consulting work um, and I've had a chance to partner with you, some of the consulting work you've done and uh, I've seen you also on the media side cover and this year you were in Birmingham, drove down, covered the Birmingham SWAC Media Day. Uh, you also done some Labor Day Classic events and looked at some other uh, opportunities. Talk about what do you do as a consultant and for those that may be out there interested in your service, uh, tell them a little bit about what you're, what you're able to do in terms of, as a consultant. Awesome. Well, thank you again. You, you're absolutely right. Um, but I am a little modest and um, so I appreciate you, you know, really putting that out there for me. So um, I have a consultant service called GT Consulting Services and uh, what we do is one-stop shop all the way from, you know, taking goals and objectives, you know, the things that you want to accomplish and uh, putting them in a project plan um, and making them a reality. So we cover, uh, you know, managing, uh, creating and managing budgets as well as um, um, media relations, public relations. So as he mentioned, you know, we uh, well, certainly, uh, I know you do a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, also a lot of event management. Absolutely. So, um, you know, you want an event, you can make it right. We can make it happen, definitely. So, <laughs> you, <laughs> back in the day, if you guys came to our Labor Day Classic weekend, and um, Dr. Camille was also one of our, our partners with, with that and his, his company, um, we definitely just know how to party. Everything is very professional. We have security. Uh, which we don't, you know, really need except for the facility requesting us to have it. Right. Um, but um, you know, make sure we have sponsors, uh, and the again the budget is correct, and you make a profit at the end. So that's that's always a great thing. I like so. that. That's why we say profit. <laughs> that's the woman of my heart. Profit. So, so yeah, go ahead. Thanks. I was gonna say thanks for uh, you know mentioning that, and we can handle all of your needs from. Um, IT to business to sports uh, event project management. Uh, so call us up, 832-293-DGSN. 
Uh, so that stands for two nine three three four seven six DGSN DG Sports and Entertainment. Certainly. Now to what we do back to the business on the sports side. I see you, Christopher LeBlanc. Julia asked you getting in here. I appreciate y'all uh, checking us out. Yeah, she's 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 a tough sister too. Michael Jones, Alcorn, the Braves. It looked like the Braves basically clinched under their way to championship. They're getting used to Houston. I think they just keep rooms on reserve. Uh, I, I, that's the way I'm getting here. Robert Vesey, we studied back in the uh, Masters uh, MBA program at Texas Southern University. That's a brilliant brother over there. I see you putting in the work. And, and finding a way to get Texas Southern involved, continue to do that work. Robert Vesey, I see you out there. Chad Jones is back in the studio. Yeah, Grambling, Grambling continues to continues to win. Uh, they say they don't want to hear about the Braves. That's not going to be a problem. But you still got Southern. Southern found a way to get it done this week. So we'll see. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> Kevin Rodeo say Donna G for President of the United States 2020. Boy, I tell you, I see you got some big fans out there. I got to get you on more often. You got the fans coming in like that. Bruce Belvin, I see you out there. Appreciate you, Bruce. Todd Jackson is getting it done on there. I need to make sure I flip this back. I gave you a light into the uh, other side of the studio there. Um, so Monica Glover, Langston English, Michelle Richardson. Hey, Doc, we had a great uh, time, I get to give a special shout out to Dr. Michelle Richardson, a professor of sport management over there at Alabama A&M. She set up uh, a game while we, in, um, we were in Windsor in Canada uh, for the NAS, North American Society of Sports Sociologists, last week. So I was doing some research. So we do our business, but at the time, you know, in the evening, we like to relax a little bit. So she got a group of us tickets to go see the Detroit Pistons oh, nice. uh, play a basketball. And then uh, my big brother, yeah. uh, Big Al, he came by. And so we got to hang out and went by the Alpha House, one of the oldest Alpha Houses, the single letter chapter down there oh, wow. in uh, Detroit. That was big time. Took yeah. a picture. I'm going to have to put yeah. that out there for the people uh, uh, getting that out there. So Avante Payton. Uh, Gene Davis, see you all. Ronnie Butler, hey Ronnie, hadn't heard of Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie, get it done, boy. If Ronnie got some old stories. We're gonna go to grave on that story, Ronnie. We gonna let the people know. Lawrence McCall in there, I see you. He say, who is the best football player in HBCU? Trust me, we gonna tell you. And and you might be surprised. Division two running backs probably battling out between uh, Virginia State and Bowie State. In fact. As we get to it, let's jump right in there, talk about it a little bit as Virginia State. And this is brought to you by Lute Williams. Many people know him as Carl Lute Williams on the Black College sports page. He does an extra, so he gives these news and notes uh, and gives you the final points. So we're going to kind of give you some insight for those folks that hadn't checked this out. Virginia State head coach Reggie Barlow, those in the SWAC area, men Barlow, as a Alabama State wide receiver that went pro and then he came back as a head coach, uh, Alabama State. And now he's at Virginia State, the Trojan over. He was perfect. Mm -hmm. The Trojans, 9-0, finished the regular season 9-0 wow. as they just nipped Virginia Union Panthers 40-39. Boy, you talking about a classic matchup. And that was on Inspired Network. That's the CIAA North, which means they will play in Salem, Virginia, CIAA championship game this weekend. Uh, so that will be interesting. Any thoughts in terms of what you heard about that matchup, 40-39, between the Virginia State Trojans and the Virginia Union Panthers? You know, that's a rivalry game, much like Prairie View, Texas Southern. Any thoughts uh, about that matchup and how it turned out? Well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to my Virginia State folks. Oh, there you go. I told you she's going to show out all night. <laughs> Paula Johnson, Johnson, go ahead. They represent uh, really hard. They all right, you know. <laughs> I like that. They, they all right. I do like the swag, but they <laughs> represent every now and then. Sean Hayes in there. Uh, we want to give them a shout out. Uh, Otis Hayes and uh, those people up there uh, in the Northeast. Uh, so, like you said, that was just a really uh, a great rival match. You know, nail biter. You know, tit for tat. Um, one one scores, another you know comes back with the score, what have you. And 
you know, just to have it that close, that, you know, that was an awesome game. Nail biter, nail biter. <laughs> but the Trojans find a way to get it done. Can they get the championship? I believe win or lose, they're in the playoffs yeah, uh, at the NCAA sure. Div Division Two. but they sure would like to come back as a ch champion. Going to playoffs undefeated, you see that. They have on the schedule about this Wednesday night game tomorrow and make mm -hmm. sure they get that 10th game in. But that's going to be interesting. Does that affect them anyway? And we now know their opponent from the Southern Division, which is Fayetteville State. Fayetteville State squeaked out a winner over, West, uh, over I should say, Winston-Salem State. I think it's 23-22. It's one-point game. Uh, as you have it. Winston-Salem State has been playing with danger all year long, kind of up and down. Lately, they've been floating around, and they couldn't get it done as they will not be playing the championship. It seemed like that was an automatic right for them to get come out of the South, and then they would find a way to win the championship game, which when many thought was a better Northern division, but not this year. Fayetteville State Broncos. Cheer goes out to the Fayetteville State Broncos as they got it done. Tuskegee with a big win over their rivals, Miles College. They were really playing good football and probably at the best time for them as they dominate Miles in that uh, victory there as they continue to get it done. And then to some, to some it was Fort Valley State uh, as they defeated their rival Albany State. So they will play Tuskegee and Fort Valley State will play for SIAC championship game. As we said, CIAA will feature Fayetteville State, the Broncos versus Virginia State. Uh, Trojans in terms of that Division Two matchup. Any of those games we talked about at the Division Two that you'd like to go in and talk a little bit about, or uh, uh, any uh, um, framework in terms of those matchups we talked before we go to the major division. Well, Fort Valley State, you know, um, some people there from there and HBCU uh, there at BMV, and um, they they're putting in some work this year. You know, yeah, you're right. Um, I also want to commend you for bringing in those. Um, those uh, divisions, the CIA, Division two. absolutely, mm -hmm. uh, and MEAC as well, because also being down here and the SWAC, you know, heavily populated, we kind of uh, forget about some of those teams, but uh, those teams, what have you, but again, I just commend you for bringing those to our attention so we can be well-rounded sports fans. <laughs> Thank you. Well-rounded. Yeah, there you go. HBCU sports fans, absolutely. and that's that's what we do with the show make sure that everybody understands that we don't just talk the swag. We'll go into the side of the swag, obviously, and we have interviews from uh, coaches uh, because they're from the area. But we actually like to go all in and make sure uh, yeah. people get a chance to kind of break down uh, what yeah, took place there. And get some of those coaches uh, on the East Coast as well. So, yeah, it'd be good to get them in uh, on the mic here yeah. uh, uh, in regards to – certainly we'll find a way to get in. We had some of them come in. And actually, while I was up in, um, uh, as I was in Norfolk, mm -hmm. excuse me, uh, with the uh, executive leadership training with Hampton. So I got a couple of coaches, a couple of numbers in terms of uh, Virginia State president, uh, head basketball coach, Joyner from uh, Hampton. So as we get a little closer to basketball, we'll bring some of those in. Uh, but let me give you some scores as we talked about Tuskegee dominating miles 50 to 20. I was surprised about the margin of score. Not necessarily Tuskegee getting it done, but the margin of score really surprised me in a lot of ways. Told you that close game in Fayetteville State just nipped out Winston-Salem State 23-22 to to concentrate for, uh, in that game. I thought that was big uh, in that matchup in a lot of ways. So that was interesting. Albany State over Fort Valley State uh, in that matchup 34-9. to Although Albany State won... The classic, that was the 28 Fountain City Classic over there in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, you had the fact that Fort Valley, uh, by the tieback rules over Benedict, because they had the head to head victory, even though Benedict won the game and had a very solid season winning 20 to 16 over Kentucky State, Fort Valley State qualified for the SIAC championship. Another one that I want to give some love to is for those Langston fans out there. Langston got it done. Yeah. We talked about this matchup with uh, Mike and Charles last weekend, mm -hmm. uh, that this was the key for the conference championship. That's the Central State Football League that Langston is moving, a member of. They'll move to the Sooner Conference next mm -hmm. year, uh, which they believe will be tougher competition. But they're going out in style mm -hmm. as they defeat the uh, Sagu, if you would, Southwest Assemblies of God University, 14-10, to 10, so they win uh, the championship. Central State 
uh, gets it done, uh, winning that conference. Langston Lions are winning 14 to 10. They were on the road in Waxahachie. That's a test matchup. So this is a quality team. They are also undefeated. So they're one of the two mid-major teams that we have undefeated. Uh, oh, wow. Continue to break it in in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, that, it also goes out of the bank because they were uh, the Tom Jordan School of the Month last month. So uh, they they were really good. They were racking up on the points and and they were racking up on the money. Hopefully. Yeah, so we want to give a, a mad shout out to Langston. Uh, I know uh, Sterling and Stephen Carter here in the uh, city are proud Langston grads. So uh, hit us up, you guys, if you're listening and watching. And uh, you can hit us up on Facebook at Dr. Kenyatta Caville for Inside the HBC Sports Lab. You can also call in 713-526-1230 to talk about okay, your HBCU uh, sports a little bit. Uh, waiting to see if we can get some of our weekly. Uh, coaches in here for the show, but uh, we'll continue to get some updates as we get into some more news of the week. Any other news of the week that you wanted to share before I give some other dis well, updates I'm, and I'm just, key performers? Uh, I'm kind of ready to get into this Howard and AMU, but anyway. I'm oh, matchups, uh, yeah. matchups of the week. Yeah, let's cover some of the, what took place last week, and then we'll, we'll get into some of these key matchups. We got Plenty of time, so we want to make sure we space everything out. Absolutely. Um, so, top performers for those uh, Prairie View fans out there, you won't like to hear this. Mm -hmm. Southern Austin Howard, uh, he had a 400 yard pass. He was one of the only 401 passes. Um, and then uh, we have uh, 4,000, four 300 yard passes this weekend. One quarterback with six touchdown passes. That was Tennessee State's. Michael Hughes, as he had a big game. Uh, you had two quarterbacks with five touchdowns, Bethune, Cookman, Larry Brim, and West Virginia State, Mac Canock got it done. 13 passes, uh, top two, 13 passes, I should say, pa pa top 200 yards. As one top 200 yards, Morgan State's Eric Harrell, as we got in here. Let's go to line one um, before we get back in here. Coach Willie Simmons. Hello? Let's see if we get some help on the radio here. One second. Okay. Hello? Yeah, coach. Can you hear me Yeah, I hear you. We had the mic down on you. Okay. How's it going? Oh, it's going well. Just, just getting off the practice field as, as usual. Uh, getting ready for this week. Certainly. Uh, before we get into the big matchup, last home game. Uh, you have on the schedule a big game this weekend. Let's do a uh, rewind and talk about the Southern Prairie game. You went down there in a tough matchup, matchup you wanted, uh, I'm sure, to get the victory. We wanted to give you a chance to, to stay in the race. And also, anytime you can get a victory, uh, I'm sure coaches always want that. But it was a tough matchup, went back and forth uh, in terms of that game in many ways. Uh, but just provide your scenario of what took place in that game. Back and forth game, and, and we knew it would be a 60 minute ball game. We talked to our team all week. Um, every time we've gone to Southern, every time they come here over the last you know, five years or so, uh, basically it's been a one possession game. And it seems like uh, either who has the ball last or who, you know, who, which team makes the most plays in the end um, comes out victorious. And you know, unfortunately for us, they made more plays than we did down the stretch. Um, you know, we, we got uh, took a little lead, um, gave up a touchdown right before halftime that was disappointing. You know, they took the ball and drove it down about 90 yards with, with uh, less than two minutes on the clock. Hit a big play to get them in the red zone and score right before halftime to go up 17-14. Uh, then we came out the second half and you know, punched it right in on the, on the ensuing drive. Not ensuing drive, but opened the drive with the second half and uh, took a lead and you know, did some good things, but just, again, had some un uh, untimely errors and breakdowns uh, defensively. Uh, gave up a big punt return um, that set him up for great field position and uh, just missed some opportunities. And, and then, then, of course, there was the, the, the call, the questionable uh, touchdown late that they had where we felt the guy pumped the ball through the end zone um, that gave them the lead. But, again, I took my hat to Southern. You know, they're a fine football team. And, um, you know, Coach Oden's done a great job there. And, um, again, we just didn't make enough plays in the end. But the guys competed. They fought hard. I'm proud of their effort, you know, proud of their resilience of, of never quitting and giving up. Uh, defense came up with a big stop uh, near the end. Got, got a big turnover and gave us the ball back. And uh, we just went able to capitalize. You know, missed, missed a couple of throws. I think Nico pressed a little bit near the end. But again, had a chance to win it. And that's what you look for. And um, I think our team will grow and learn from that game, uh, just like we have from all the games this year. As we continue to try to build this 
program into the championship caliber team that we think we're capable of defending. Certainly, you talked about Nico. Uh, last couple of games, you allowed a redshirt freshman to play. Analyze his play. I thought he came up uh, pretty big in the game. Obviously, uh, that last drive, you may want to see a little more there. But talk about uh, what he's doing well and where you'd like to see some improvement. Well, you know, I think he's done a really good job of first accepting um, the, the change. You know, anytime you, you have a, a situation like that where you, know, you make a switch um, midway through the season and you go to younger guys, um, you know, you always wonder how that guy's going to respond. Awesome. But you know, Nico's been uh, steady Eddie, you know, kind of as we like to call it, and there's been even kills. You know, whether he was a first team guy, second team guy, third team guy, he's continued to come to work every day, um, enthusiastic. You know, he loves football, he studies film, he has good questions. Um, you know, again, he, he, he's trying to lead, you know, when he has the opportunity to. And so he has a really bright future. Um, again, but he's, he's only 19 years old. He's a redshirt freshman, you know, playing his first uh, meaningful down of college football. So, um, again, he, he's making some really good decisions. You know, he threw three touchdown passes without an interception. Um, I think all one game, I think he threw three, in the, three touchdowns, um, I think, without an interception or maybe one. But, you know, he's making really good decisions. Um, he, he's got to take some of those check downs and, and get the ball underneath a little bit to get his completion percentage up because we, he's still hovering below 50%, which, you know, you, you want to be somewhere close to 60, but, you know, he, he's below 50%, which we are as a team as well. So that's something that we definitely got to work on. But he's doing a lot of really good things, and I think the more snaps that he takes, he'll continue to learn. Took a real big shot last week on his shoulder, had, had a you know, bump shoulder, but came back and finished the game, which showed a lot of toughness and, and perseverance by him. So we have a bright future with him at the helm, and uh, just, just looking forward to seeing him continue to develop as a quarterback and you know, leader of this team. Certainly. Uh, talk a little bit about Stephon McCray. He went uh, for 138 yards, a touchdown on 16 carries. How is he uh, looking this season for you? You know, really ran with a purpose. You know, I was really proud of him. You know, we, we, we talked going into the week about him coming to big game. You know, he's been banged up all year. He's been dealing with a nagging groin injury. And anybody who's had a groin injury before knows the only way to, to heal that is rest. And, of course, you know, in football, you, you never have a time to rest. Um, you know, he missed the ground the game altogether. Uh, but every game after that, he's been trying to push through it. And in the bye week and the game against McCone really gave him a, a chance to get the, the extra rest that he needed, and he came out Saturday and ran, I mean, like a man possessed, and, and broke tackles, um, had, to, had to fumble on the first play, uh, but came back and responded after that, and like you said, ran for 138 yards on 16 carries, and uh, really ran with a purpose. So we'll need him down the stretch because the best thing for a young quarterback is to have a strong running game, and with him continuing to run the way that he is, the way he is still continuing to run very well. You know, and Caleb Roach is starting to come on as well, so we feel like we have a nice three-headed monster in the backfield. Uh, of course, led by Stephon, and uh, hopefully he can have a big game this week against Pablo. Certainly. Uh, with that, uh, Charles Bishop, as you know, usually in the studio with me, they take over the show last week with Mike, and then now they, they said, you know, one Charles Bishop claims he's sick. I don't understand how you get sick during football season. And, I mean, nobody else can take off like that. But he's out of the studio. And then Mike Washington, we give him a little credit. He said he had family dudes. So we're we going to let him be responsible. That's what he said. So we're going to check on him a little bit here. But it gives us a chance to have a special guest in here, Donna Glover, known better as Donna G. I'm going to let her jump in and ask a follow-up question. We, we, we're beautifying the studio in a lot. <laughs> All right, Coach. Watch this. Watch this. Hey, Coach, so I want no trouble now. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm not sure if you remember me uh, when I came down to Birmingham with you guys for the Swing yes, Media ma Day. But I uh, always uh, just an extreme fan of yours as well as DB football. Um, so, as you know, uh, sometimes in, I'm in the, the back houses and um, the back blogs or the the back rooms where the real sports fans, are, you know, diehard TV fans are, are there. And so uh, we want to know what's going on. <laughs> we got to have some more games, you know, wins, uh, and uh, we want some more W's. So do well, you think it's uh, more on our talent, you know, the coaching, uh, both, you know, what's, what's, what's really happening? Because, uh, you know, we got this big stadium, we got to keep filling it up. And we got to, as I mentioned at the start of the show, we're, uh, you know, talking about athletics funding universities. So we want to make sure that we always keep those big dollars rolling in. 
Oh, with well, no question. And I totally understand that. And, you know, when I took this job three years ago, you know, I understood the, 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 the culture of what I was coming into. You know, Prairie Ridge School has a lot of rich history. A lot of that history is, is older, you know, back mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s when they were a powerhouse. And, and, and you know, the, the P, PD Nation wants to get those glory days back. And, you know, of course, I've been charged with, with you know, getting the program back to that level. And, and of course, this year has been disappointing. You know, nobody's more trusting, nobody's more disappointed <laughs> this season, you know, than me. And had high mm-hmm. aspirations coming into the season. You know, we really thought we had a team that was able to compete for a championship. And, you know, there's some things that happened, um, you know, that, that kind of uh, hurt that a little bit. You know, we lost uh, three offensive linemen before the season began that we were really counting on. You know, um, Gustavo Lopez, who was a starting center for us last year, and Nick Paul, who was a key backup for us last year. You know, they, those were two guys that we figured would be starters on the offensive line. And, unfortunately, both of them, um, you know, Failed, not, I don't want to say failed out, but they didn't take care of the business academically, okay. and so they're not, they're not with the team right now. Um, they're eligible to compete. Um, Donovan Wheaton, who was the first team all conference selection preseason, you know, got in a car accident on um, 4th of July back in Dallas, back in, no, back in his hometown. So he's out for the entire season. You know, so what was a strength for us going into the season has now become a liability because we're playing with a true freshman star on right guard basically a transfer left, left guard who had played a whole lot of college football, his backup is a true freshman, um, a walk-on right tackle, you know, that, that we gave a scholarship to. And so we're, we're trying to, you know, put together an offensive of line that can give us a chance to compete. Um, you know, and, and that's really the biggest thing. And, and, and we played a tough schedule. You know, we played three teams right now that's ranked in the MCS top 25. Uh, Sam right. Houston's ranked number four. Uh, Ramlin's ranked number 11, and Nichols is ranked, I think, number 15. <laughs> so we played three of the best teams in, in LCS football. Alcorn is, you know, of course, the reigning Eastern Division champ. And so is a team that's always tough, and, you know, and we've been in all those ball games. So, again, I, I know we want to win the championships, but in the game of football, the ball, the ball has to bounce away a lot of times, and this, this year it's just had bounced our way. But we're, we're, we're not, you know, discouraged. We're disappointed, but we're not discouraged because we do feel like we're doing the right things. And by doing the right things, we think the wins will come at the level that, you know, you and the rest of PB Nation wants, and that we'll be hosting and enforcing that trophy here, you know, sooner rather than later. Told you, so we, in terms of, uh, I want to look at the uh, next game, but I wanted to say, as they said, we beautify the studio, but it doesn't mean we don't have hard hitting. Did you have a follow-up question you want to interrupt you there? <laughs> oh, absolutely. So um, I wanted to just uh, kind of piggyback on that when you talked about, you know, the players being out. Is there a strategy, I guess, going forward, and, and I'll probably always in the future, of, uh, you know, taking some of those those key positions and, you know, making sure that the backups are there, that they're trained ahead of time, so that when um, things come about or, you know, just accidents or, you know, whatever, some of the things you just named, failures, what have you, you know, we're able to backfill those positions with talented players. All of them are talented, though. Don't, yeah, I don't want to well, say it like that. But just making sure that they're ready to jump jump into the game. You know. I, I, and, and again, I understand your question. And, and we and trust, we do the guys that are playing. They are talented. Um, the freshmen that are playing are talented guys, but they're 18 years old. And they, back to this time, they were getting ready for state playoffs. You know, the Bulls are trying to get ready to win a swag championship. So, again, you know, Danny Garza, Danny Garza has a bright future here at Prairie BNL. You know, we, we didn't sign him with the, the anticipation that he had to come in and start from day one at right guard. But John Jones um, from Garland Centennial has a very bright future here at Prairie BNL. Again, didn't sign him with the anticipation that he'd be, you know, starting the last three games of the season. You know, Roger Smith, the transfer from Utah State, that has a very bright future here. Didn't sign him with the anticipation that he's got to start left guard the entire season. And so, again, those guys are going to be really good players, you know, but they're young. And, and so when you have young players and you're going against teams who have four to five teams, we lost who have senior quarterbacks. You know, the Norris Footman is, is a three-year starter for Alcorn State, one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Uh, Devontae Kincaid is the reigning sweat player of the year, is a senior. You know, Austin Howell's a four-year starter who's won that sweat championship at Southern. You know, uh, uh, the kid at Sam Houston, Jeremiah Briscoe, is probably an NFL player. And so when, you have, when you're going up against teams like that, they have senior quarterbacks, and we're playing with a redshirt freshman, you know, naturally those guys are going to do a little bit more poised in, in big game situations. So the throws that Nico missed, Austin Howard didn't miss those because he's been in those type of situations in those games. And so, again, it's not a talent deficit here. I don't think that's the case. 
I think we have a lot of young talent. We we got to groom that talent, and we got to continue to recruit to, like you say, get quality depth. But again, when you when you sign those guys, you really don't sign them with anticipation that they'll come in and have to start. You sign them with anticipation that they'll be good backups early on, and then they'll develop in the starters. But when those guys are forced into playing right off top, you're going to go through those growing pains, and that's what we're doing right now. We're going through some growing pains, but again, the future looks very bright, and we just have to understand that in building a program, you're going to go through those lumps. And you know, like I said, we'll, we'll get there. You know, we thought we had a team this year that could, but some things happened, unfortunately, that were you know out of our control. And it's caused us to you know, not be as explosive as we want to be offensively and not be able to do some of the things that we would have liked to do, you know, coming into the season. Hey, there's some, uh, sorry, there's Let me uh, get into the Pine Bluff matchup uh, in terms of uh, what you have this weekend. What do you see from Pine Bluff? Uh, you know, I see a team that's playing really confident right now. You know, they played Grambling to a five-point game last week. They played Southern to a seven-point game, came back and made a seven-point game. Uh, two weeks ago. So, you know, they're a team that's, that's playing good football right now. Offensively, they're doing some really good things. Um, you know, Coach Coleman, the, 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 the elder statesman of the, of the league, he's been around the longest, and uh, he's always, you know, filled with tough teams. And so, again, you know, I think they'll come in here ready to play. It's senior day for us, so hopefully our guys can match, you know, their intensity and even play a little bit higher, you know, because, again, it's our last time this year playing the Black Sea Field and Panther Stadium. and. You know, we want to send our seniors out the right way. It's Military Appreciation Day. You know, Prairie View has a long military history, and we want to make sure that we commemorate those guys and, and really do a great job of honoring them by, you know, coming out of there victorious. And so we need to play a clean, sound game, uh, not beat ourselves. And a lot of these young guys that we're talking about that now have been playing for eight, nine games uh, are really going to have to, you know, step up and play some, some, some big roles for us this week. Certainly. Uh, you set me up there. My grandfather... Chaffer's Pitt Cavill Sr. graduated Prairie View in 1947, was the first of two in his class to graduate part of the ROTC program at Prairie View. So you're right, long, long history, uh, military history at Prairie View Indian University. So it'll be interesting to get the military people out there. But let's talk about from a defensive side. It seems like Pine Bluff has been able to score some points uh, throughout the season. They just haven't been able to stop some people. Uh, are there some things that you see on the offensive side uh, that particularly you want to attack? Uh, well, you know, again, they, their strength has been offense. Uh, you, like you said, they've given up some points on the defensive side of the ball this year. The offense has kept them in some games. So, you know, Coach Street knows he has his hands full. You know, again, they're an offense that's very multiple. Um, you know, it looks like every week you kind of see a different offense. So you don't know necessarily which scheme they're going to come out with this week and some of the things they're going to do. So, I think we have to kind of play that chess match early on to see what their philosophy is going to be coming into the game and then make the necessary adjustments. Um, but defensively, they're kind of a bend but don't break style of defense. They want to try to keep everything in front. Um, they're going to, you know, they don't pressure a ton, uh, but when they do, you know, they, they, they ask those defensive backs to be on island. So there's some possibilities for some big plays, you know, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we have to, as an offensive line, we got to play well. And that's all that's been the challenge for us this year. You know, we've got to ask those guys to play well. To open up running lanes for Stefan and Dewanye and Caleb to protect Nico, you know, allow him to get comfortable and make throws. And Kadera Hodge is really playing well right now. You know, I think he's playing one of the top receivers in the nation right now. And we got to find a way to get him the ball. You know, Josh Simmons is getting back healthy. You know, we got to be able to stretch the field with him. And Darius Floyd is getting healthy, so we got to be able to get the ball to him in space and allow him to make plays. And if we can do that, you know, I think we have a chance to really move the ball and score some points uh, because, you know, judging by what they've done offensively. You know, I think, I think we're going to have to score some points this week to be able to beat them. Thank you, Coach, for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next week at the same time, giving us a review and preview of the following week's game. And as we say about this sign, go Panthers. Go Panthers. Thank go you, Panthers. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, let's see. I think we have our next caller in. Uh, I guess they're setting that caller up. Uh, as we get into it, we'll do the top ten poll ranking shortly. Let me see if I can get back in here. This is Coach Haywood. What's going on? Good to have you on. Got that victory. I saw the video. It looked like there was some excitement in that locker room last weekend, Coach. Well, there's some excitement, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's good, good. Uh, let go over that matchup. You travel down to the Del the Devils uh, with Mississippi and to the Delta uh, framework of that game. Talk a little bit about that matchup. Uh, well, as, as you know, we have a two-question quarterback, so 
I think that uh, our main objective was to put the weight on the offensive line wide receivers and the running back. And they needed to be able to raise their game up to a higher level to take a lot of that uh, initial pressure off of the quarterback. And I think we did a pretty good job because, you know, we ran the ball and uh, did a nice job of running the football. Uh, wide receivers did a decent job of blocking downfield. Running backs ran well. The quarterback runs that we had, uh, Eli really ran a lot better than what we thought he would, would have done. And, uh, you know, some of the, some of the new run game that we put in was a change drop in which they didn't adjust to it until the second half. So I think offensively we did a good job. Special team wise, we were adequate. Uh, and then uh, defense, we really played well uh, in the first quarter. And then we struggled at the end of the third quarter, I mean, end of the second quarter, where uh, they needed to fall down with 327 left to go in the game and scored a touchdown. And, you know, when we came up at halftime, I said, oh, you guys don't understand. Here we go again. We have Alabama State all over again. They don't know what's going on. We come back. Yeah, we come back and we have our shoulders down, our head down, and we just keep playing like that. And that's what we did. And then we scored a touchdown. So it's kind of 21. It's nothing. It's 21 to 7. And they have the momentum. He came back in the third quarter. They go, uh, we go 21 17. Beginning of the fourth, it's 21 21 because we have no momentum. Uh, we got several turnovers uh, in the game. Uh, Sean Jones and I with an interception. You and Marcus Jones were from the corner. Recovery Anthony Johnson was stressed, which changed the whole complexion of the game. He's been there to score two touchdowns in the field goal and go up 30, uh, 38 21. Certainly, uh, I'm sure that you excited the way Elijah Odom played in that game. 172 yards, touch, two touchdowns on 23 carries. Talk a little bit about uh, what he was able to do in that matchup. Well, I think Elijah did what we asked him to do because it was a heavy, heavy run offensive game plan. Uh, and then if we were throwing the ball, we were trying to get the ball out of his hands quick. Um, and, you know, I think he did a nice job of just getting the ball out of his hands. Uh, but he really did a nice job in the run leads and the zone leads in which we had. And uh, we're going to have to do, we have different runs this week that we've implemented because, you know, we can go on with some of the same runs, but we have to put in new runs so that we can attack uh, the southern uh, defense totally different. Uh, but, you know, we're looking forward to uh, a good game plan for the Blue Cats because they're an outstanding football team. And we look forward to Certainly, before we go into this week's matchup, uh, last week, as you know, uh, Charles Bishop tried to take over the show, asking several questions. Uh, Mike Washington followed the suit early in the show, uh, so I had to let them go. They out of the they out of the studio. <laughs> Just kidding. Charles Bishop is sick. He's watching on the show, so uh, I thought I'd throw yeah. him a good a good, good jab. And uh, Mike is uh, being a great father, uh, taking care of uh, the children as they're up for some awards, so he couldn't get in the studio. So it gave me a chance to bring on a colleague here, uh, Donna Glover, known as Donna G. So she's in the studio, and so I'm going to give her a chance to ask a follow-up question if you don't mind, Coach. Hi, Coach. How are you doing? Mr. Donna G, I'm doing well with yourself. Good, good. I hadn't had a chance to meet you one on one, but definitely a fan of Tiger football. Uh, other than when we're playing uh, each other, Prairie View, for the Labor Day Classic or whatnot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> see that? You see that, Coach? Yeah, we we support you know our sister school until we, we have to play each other. Hey, I understand. I, I got that knife in my side. <laughs> Absolutely. So listen, well, I guess I got to follow that part up, which is, again, as I mentioned um, to Coach Simmons, you know, we, we love you guys. We know definitely some talented young men out on the field, um, but we want to see some wins. So what can we do in order, you know, going forward and as well as next year, preparing the team to um, putting some W's on the board uh, and getting those uh, scores up? Well, one, of the things that we, one of the things that we have to do is that we're going to lose, uh, I think, eight or nine seniors this year. So we're not, a, we're, not a, we're not an experienced team and we're not an older team. We're carrying 24 freshmen on every trip with us. Sometimes 24 plays, sometimes 17 plays. All right, so we're building a 
foundation and try to change the, the history uh, or go back to the history when we become a dominant football team. So with that being said, um, last week we put Coach Elias out on the road in Mississippi and recruiting, recruiting junior colleges in, every, in Mississippi. So we get all the senior colleges in Mississippi. So with this incoming class in which we're going to have, we're going to have junior college, transfer, and only a few high school players because we need a little bit more experience and leadership with this young class and our freshmen and sophomores in which we're playing with. Certainly. Thanks for that follow-up. Let's go into this matchup this weekend as you have Southern coming to town, and uh, they just came off a big victory uh, at home against Prairie View and m University. Uh, looking at the film of Southern, seems to always be a solid team. What are you seeing from Southern as you watch the film? Well, one of the things that Southern is always up at the top is, well, first of all, they have great leadership with Coach Odom. I've known Coach Odom since I, I think it was 1995 or 96 when we lived in the same neighborhood uh, in Baton Rouge. And so I've known him for a significant period of time, and he's an outstanding football coach. But one of the things that they do is that they have probably the best offensive line in the sweat. And they do a tremendous job of running the football. With that being said, they cause you some problems because they have three tight ends that weigh approximately 750 pounds. So they're able to pound you with tight ends, extend the formation and make you and make you force you to be gapped out. But then they're able to go play action pass with these tight ends in the game that run really well and create some problems for you because they leave that 12 personnel on the field with two tight ends and then they stretch you down the field. So you may be in a run call and then they're play action pass on the football. So I think that he's really built a solid football team from an offensive standpoint with good receivers, great quarterbacks, and a solid running back. When you go to the defense side of the ball, what makes them a little bit better this year is up front, their uh, front four. They're a little bit better than they were last year, and they're doing a better job of penetrating, getting up the tail. Secondary is, is really fast, linebackers are solid. And so we have to make sure that we attack uh, the different coverages and the different uh, fronts in which they give us to make sure that we have some success. But they're an outstanding football team, and we're looking forward to the challenge. So are you saying that uh, we need to give these guys some um, some greens and cornbread, <laughs> build them up <laughs> here in the city? Well, I'm, well, I'm saying that we, we need to give them some greens and cornbread, all ball, post ball, but, but at the same time, <laughs> what it really boils down to is that we're going to have to find ways that we can keep these guys here over the summer so that we can get bigger and stronger over the summer. Because they go home for six to seven weeks, and you put it on them to work out. Half of them work out, half of them don't. So we're going to have to find a way that we can keep these guys here by providing jobs for them, opportunities to work, internships. And we're going to reach out to the alumni to see if we can get some help in that area that provides uh, opportunities to work for these young people. So that way, we'll have a great opportunity to keep them here, and they can work out every day. They can run, work out in the morning, run in the afternoon, and then they can work during the day. So, you know, that's what we're looking forward to doing. Certainly. Any final part of the matchup with Southern uh, that we need to keep our eyes on in regards to the key uh, game coming up this week? Well, I think the punt, punt return matchup is going to be key because they do a tremendous job. They lead the conference and return with 17.7 yards return, running wall return right, wall return left. So we're going to have to do a really good job of getting down and covering. And then at the same time, as Coach Odom said yesterday on, on his press conference, it's going to be who can run the football because he wants to run the football. We want to run the football, so we're going to see who wants the football best and who can play action pass the best. Certainly. With that, Coach, I want to say thank you for coming on with your time. We look forward to seeing, hearing from you next week about the matchup and the following week as we start to close out the season. As we say, go Tigers. Go okay. Tigers. Thank you guys very much. Thank hey. you.
I was going to say, Dr. Cavill, if he's really uh, serious and, and, you know, want to, uh, first of all, I want to challenge the uh, TSU alumni from what he just said uh, to make an opportunity available to those players in the summertime via uh, internships, uh, co-ops, and things of that nature, as well as giving uh, funds, so that money when we need it. So I'm, gonna, I'm challenging you, I think, as uh, our putting it to the test as Coach uh, Haywood challenged Texas, Texas Southern uh, alumni to make those opportunities available for those young people this summer. And I'm willing to uh, partner with the athletic program, Dr. McClellan and Dr. Creel, and Coach Haywood to uh, try to make those things happen. Certainly. I think that's a strong challenge that we all need to take advantage of and make sure we're doing a part. Because as he said, that's really a, a, a good thing in those areas when you talk about those uh, programs that tend to win consistently. They find a better way of kicking their kids on campus to make sure they hit the programs. Uh, they find a way uh, to make sure uh, as you build the program that you have those players staying around so when they get to particular junior senior years, you you in that championship ready uh, type program. We see that with Gramlin, what they've been able to do the last two years, junior transfer quarterback coming in, and now he's a senior. You see that with Alcorn State with their senior leadership at the quarterback position. So uh, you see Southern, another a team that is winning with a senior quarterback. So you start to see that refrain, so it means a lot there. We have Jeremy Cheeks uh, in here, Corey Williams, Mark Nelson, uh, Jimmy Wilson uh, working on that sound. Appreciate that. Anybody else on there that you want to give a shout out that we see there? Well, I'd like to give a shout out. Uh, I see some Grandma Tigers on here. Angelique Moody, Ryan. Want to say hello and what's up with her? Uh, I see. Oh, Charles Bishop is uh, watching in. Hey, Charles. Look, I might be trying to take your spot. <laughs> Yeah, stay sick if you want to. You can Charles gonna be running in here. This <laughs> <laughs> trying to get it tonight. I like that. That's a good one, though. You, you, I like you, you, good. <laughs> so we're gonna give you the Big Band Weekly Honors report in regards to those players that were outstanding this weekend, earning awards. Texas Southern Tigers quarterback Elijah Odom. Um, in terms of what he was able to do. He was the third string quarterback for the Tigers, getting it done. Odom did only complete but three passes for 64 yards, uh, but he was able to rush uh, for 172 on 23 carries, as we talked about, and two touchdowns. Big game for him. Southern Jaguars freshman wide receiver Kendall uh, Catalan played an outstanding game. He had six receptions for 175 yards, so he got it done. He was leading leading the receivers for the Jaguars in a must-win game against the Prairie Views and the Prairie View and the Panthers, and they got it done. Uh, running back, another name to mention was Stephon McCray. Uh, he balled out against the uh, Texas Southern uh, Jaguars. He had 16 carries, 138 rushing yards. We talked a little bit about that. He had one touchdown. The long run of the day was a 49-yard that was spectacular as he got it done. And then we also have linebacker Sean Jones. He was a Ben L. Calva finalist last year. Uh, hurt a little bit this season, but he's back in the mix getting it done. He finished with nine tackles, which led the team. He also had three tackles for a loss and two sacks. He uh, added the interception to his impressive stat line, getting it done there, as well as linebacker Jalen Coleman played an outstanding game. He had led the Panthers defense with 10 tackles. He also had one tackle for a loss, including a quarterback hit during that game. And finally, uh, in terms of a kicker, Texas Southern Tigers kicker, uh, Aaron Cuevas was perfect. All, all field goals and extra points against Mississippi Valley. He connected on five extra points. He also connected on a 24-yard field goal as he got it done, leading us to the Big Ben Award Players of the Week. Offensive Player of the Week was Texas Southern Elijah Odom getting it in, and Texas Southern Sean Jones is the Big Ben Award Defensive Player of the Week. Texas Southern Aaron Cuevas is the Big Ben Award Specialist uh, Player of the Week in regards to uh, what – goes on this week and so that do it for the Big Ben uh, sticker players of the week did you have any national honors Big Ben play, uh, players that you'd like to give a helmet sticker to anybody that stood out to you particularly this week uh, not really no I'm going to get them all ready for next time no problem uh, let's look at the top 10 we'll go with the mid-major division first give you the top 10 and usually what we do here is I give the top 10 list and then you get a chance to say on the top 10 whether you think some teams deserve to be there in the top 10 maybe move up top five bottom five gives you a chance to kind of show out uh, where you think teams should be 
Nobody dropped out this week, uh, uh, week number 10, as you start to close down on the mid-major week, as we told you about some big games to watch. We'll get into some of uh, our major and mid-major games. We talked a little bit about the matchup between Arkansas Pine Bluff and Prairie View with uh, Coach Willie Simmons, and then obviously we talked about the big matchup as Southern comes into town uh, to face Texas Southern University, uh, talking with Mike Haywood. But let's look at this top 10 mid-major teams. We have Winston-Salem State Rams. With their loss, they fall to number 10. Uh, this is last year's the Black College National Champion, so you see they took a hit 6-4, 4-3. You have number 9, Virginia Union Panthers, 6-4, and 5-2. Uh, then at number 8, Miles Golden Bears, 6-4, four, 4-2. Four, uh, they dropped down two spots after they lost to Tuskegee. You have Fort Valley State Wildcats, 5-4, five 5-1 five on the season. Although they lost, they still move up two spots uh, as they will be playing for an SIC championship game this week against Tuskegee, and we'll tell you what Tuskegee's rank. Um, number six, Fayetteville State Broncos move up four spots. Impressive win over Winston-Salem State, six and four, five and two. Uh, they get it done, bringing us to number five, probably the surprise team of the year in a lot of ways. Benedict Tigers, seven and two, five and one. That one stumble to Fort Valley State hurt them as uh, they lost the head-to-head -head tiebreaker at Fort Valley State, but still a very impressive season as they end up at number five right now. Uh, at number four, Tuskegee Golden Tigers sitting at eight and two, six and zero. Oh, started off slow, some particular games, non-conference games well, but they got two big victories over SWAC schools. They had a win over Alabama State and a win over Jackson State. Anytime you step up for Division II FCS and get a win, you're doing something right, and the Tuskegee Golden Tigers did that, setting up a top 10 matchup for the SIC championship, number four versus number seven, Fort Valley State Wildcats. Moving up to the top three, these teams are really playing some good football. Bowie State uh, sitting at, uh, Bowie State, I should say, sitting at nine and one, six and one. Um, at number two, Langston Tigers, one of only two mid-major teams undefeated. Langston Lions are 9-0, 7-0 in the conference race. Big win over Southwest Assembly is a god, meaning that they clinch at least a share of the championship. They win it this week. They'll win it outright. They have four first-place votes, and they are undefeated, playing some really good football. All but you have Virginia State Trojans also undefeated, sitting at 9-0, 7-0. Both of them go perfect, not only in terms of the conference schedule, but overall, they have six first place wins, uh, as six first place votes, I should say, as they get it done. And they'll be playing for a CIAA championship this week as they had that big victory over Virginia Union, setting up another top 10 matchup, number one versus number six in Salem, Virginia. So it should be interesting there in terms of that matchup. So that'll do it for our top 10 mid major poll rankings this week. Donna Glover, any problems with? My mid-major top ten rankings. Some teams that you think are out of place? Uh, well, I think those are pretty good. I, I was going to push some other things, but I think that you're going to have the, the teams that I'm looking for in the mid-major mm -hmm. division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's coming, division. It's coming up right uh, now. So C has some questions <laughs> uh, here. So you say maybe here you'll see dropping out this week with a tough win on the road. Purvey and MU Panthers sitting at 3-5, 2-3, and five, two and three, giving room from Alabama State. Three and five, two and two. They've won three straight games, so we'll see if they can get it done. Uh, obviously, they had that tough loss early in the season to Prairie View and Panthers, but they got blown out. But now they have an interim coach in here that's taking place. It seems they're heading in the right direction. We shall see if this is the real Hornets or will they falter this week with a key matchup. Sitting at number nine, Tennessee State. Uh, they stepped out of conference against Virginia Lynchburg, and they got a big victory, five and four, to stop that slide as they lost four straight. Boy, were they bumming, and they needed a win, and they got it done. Bringing us to number eight, Hampton Pirates sitting at five and four, four and two. They dropped one spot after a tough loss. Uh, and see if they can rebound this week. I would have loved to have a chance to stay over, but as I said, I had to fly from Norfolk all the way over to Windsor, so I couldn't stay in town to see those matchups. Bringing us to number seven, Bethune Cookman Wildcats. Really rebounding well as they had hit a slide in the middle of the season, but they've won the last couple of games. They're sitting at five and four, four and two. They move up a spot. They continue to get it done on the defensive side and win some big games as they got it done today. At number six, Southern Jaguars, six and three, four and one. They're steady. 
People are having concern with the defense, but they're looking forward to that big matchup with Gramlin. But this coach Odom finds a way just to get it done. He continues to win after bouncing back after that tough loss from Alcorn State early in the season. They do fall a spot, even though they got a close win uh, because of the big win by the Braves over the Alabama A&M Bulldogs. The Braves move to six and three, four and one. They move up one spot as they go to five. Southern drops to three, bring us to number four. North Carolina Central the Eagles, seven and two. Five and one, uh, they move up a spot as they continue to get it done on the defensive side of the ball. They hold uh, the defense opponents uh, and able to score on defense and get it done on defense as they try to set up and maintain just in enough space for the end of the season matchup, possibly with the Aggies, to see if they can find a way to squeak out a championship. Then you have number three, Howard Bison, six and three, five and one. They continue to roll. They're back in the football business. They have a young man at the quarterback position named Newton. Yeah, you're familiar with the last name, but this is Kalen Newton, and he can let it toss, and he is a leader of that team, and he gets it done surprising everybody. Howard Bison is back in the football, and they're doing this with the true freshmen. Have a lot of talent. Feel y'all the running back makes it easy. As you heard the coaches talk about, if you can have that running back, they make it a little easier and run the football uh, with a young quarterback. You can do some magical things, and their offensive line is very solid. They continue to win, and the defense is playing better than most people would give them credit for. Bringing us to the Grambling State Tigers at number two. Eight and one, five and oh, five first place votes. All this team does is win. All we do is win. If you talk about the song there, well, that is the Grambling State Tigers. They continue to get it done. Bringing us to number one, North Carolina A&T Aggies, seven first place votes. They are the lone undefeated F. CS program in the major division sitting at 9-0, and 6-0. They continue to win, and they're doing it in a different style than they've done it in the past. They're able to pass the ball now, not just run the ball, still solid on defense, the calling card, uh, but this is a very good football team, and it looks like maybe a collision course for the celebration bowl between a and and Grambling State. My fans from Southern, they said, not so fast in terms of the Bayou Classic, and obviously those Eagles said, hey, we don't lose to the Aggies in terms of what they get done as they've won the last three matchups and a share of the championship. So don't be surprised in terms of that matchup. That's another one that's interesting to keep your eyes on. That's my top ten in the major division. Do you have some qualms, questions, or <laughs> remarks in terms of what you see here? Well, I definitely think all of those are great. So I'm going to uh, give you a, a thumbs up on that and concur. Uh, I heard you put Look at it. I like that. In there, uh, Another check in the mail, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard you put Grandma in the celebration ball. So have you, are you throwing all corn out? Ah, that's a great point. Uh, I Yes, I guess I am throwing it out there. But I think you make a point uh, that Alcorn Braves, they would say, hold up, we're not out of the picture. And they basically clinched the East. Uh, and they're playing some good football. And that's a different team uh, with the quarterback uh, when, they're, when they're out there footman playing. So I think you make a good point. Uh, uh, they gave the G-men everything they wanted, particularly in the first half. And if it wasn't for a drop ball that you're probably referencing last year, right. the Braves would have been back in the Celebration Bowl for a second consecutive year. And they're hungry. They want to get back to the Celebration Bowl and see if they can uh, fight their nemesis in North Carolina a t Because in the inaugural game, that was a matchup featuring the Aggies and the Braves. And the Aggies got the best of the Braves in that matchup. So right. very astute point as you get it done in that matchup. So um, your thoughts, can Gramlin – Beat all corner? Are you going with the Braves, or do you even have upset in terms of Southern? Do you think Southern oh. in the Bayou Classic? Wow! Yeah, you, you know, you, you put in a um, uh, game changer with Southern there. I'm gonna still stick with uh, Grambling and all corner. Love my uh, Jags, but I'm gonna stick with them uh, probably in the SWAC championship, and then we'll see who uh, tests it out from that. But just a bit, make a plug about our championships. I want you know, as you guys know. This uh, well, it's stated to be the last year of right. the championship here in Houston, and so I just would implore you guys to come on out, even if you did not attend the uh, teams that might be um, playing. And then we want to uh, just make sure that we're supporting each other, as well as the celebration bowl. You know, that's our bowl. You know, just as the Rose Bowl or some of these other bowls that are taking place with PWI and these larger conferences. So we want to make sure that we're supporting the Celebration Bowl and both opportunities. We have a great, grand time. So, uh, well you know, said, well come, said. Come out, come out. And then last but not least, I want to give a plug out for the Labor Day Classic. 
this year it has been moved uh, to uh, Thanksgiving, but when we come back next year, we're going to have a great uh, weekend of events. We're looking forward to our committees coming together and uh, making some things pop here in Houston. And uh, <laughs> I like it. I like we want to set it off. You know, we, they've had a, a long run with the buy. I mean, the Bayou Classic. Uh, whatever, so we're going to try to give him a run for that money. Charles Bishop, no qualms. He's going to give up his seat. Boy, I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> be careful there. UT. a and uh, Jimmy Wilson said a and is ranked in the top ten of the FCS. That's a great point and well stated. He said Howard deserves it after they've been down for a while. Absolutely. Another good one. Uh, Stan Hardy is on here. GSU undefeated 2017. I see, I see. All right. Hardy is, is making some little Blake Green, another NBA student of mine, TSU. Uh, he's a brilliant brother as well. I gave a shout-out to Dr. Jeremy Cheeks, Corey Williams, Mark Nelson. I see you on there. Appreciate you uh, uh, giving some love there. Arnett Cavill, as he says it there in that, in that neck of the woods, a cousin, uh, getting it done there. He said, no upset in the B.C. Jimmy says it will not happen. Grambling will get it done as they continue to move. As we start to come to the close of the show, let's look at a couple of matchups and see if you have any thoughts on these uh, coming out of the SWAC. Jackson travels to Alabama A&M uh, this weekend. Uh, they finally got a big win over Mississippi Valley, but they uh, had a tough loss this past weekend as they – are one and eight, one and five. Alabama A and M sitting at three and six, three and two. Tough losses. They wanted to try to make a statement for a championship run. Do you have a pick? You going with this game or any? They kind of hand in hand to me. You know, they they both have lost some traction over these uh, this year or so, and so I'm, I'm hate, I hate to see that. Uh, good for Brady, of course, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I, I'm I, I think they're I don't know who will be the winner. That's kind of like tied uh, as far as their program. But you can always take the safe bet and go with the home team. Alabama ain't in the Bulldogs. That's kind of how I, I flow it out when you go with the home team. We're gonna save uh, Prairie View for last here. So let's skip down to Grambling. Traveling at Alabama State. Alabama State, as I said, have won three straight games. Grambling State just continues to do what they're doing. Does Alabama State, do the Hornets have a ch shot? Nah, nah, we're going to give it to the G-Men. <laughs> <laughs> Love y'all Hornets, but y'all got to come a little bit better. <laughs> then you have Mississippi Valley State traveling to Alcorn State. This is a battle of Mississippi between these two schools. As we said, Alcorn State got their big victory over Alabama, and they're rolling. Uh, one more victory certainly locks things up for them to guarantee their trip to Houston. And Mississippi Valley State had that win earlier against uh, Pine Bluff. Looked like they would maybe go on the road and get a couple of victories. Couldn't get it done against Jackson State. Just lost a tough game to Texas Southern University. Both of these teams got their first win against Valley. Uh, does Valley, the Delta Tellers, do they even have a shot on the road uh, against the Braves? <laughs> I'm going to go with the Braves. <laughs> it's like, no. Jimmy said, all for by 20. Alabama over A&M over Jackson State. Uh, Jimmy said, it'll help you out there. Let's go with Southern and Texas Southern. Uh, you know, I know you have friends over there at Texas Southern University, but you got to call it. This is Southern between Southern and Texas Southern. Southern with their big first victory of the season. Southern keeps winning. They need to win to stay in the race against uh, Grambling State as they already have that one loss, so they can't afford another one. Uh, does Texas Southern have a chance to, for the upset at home here at BBVA Compass Stadium? I, I think they have a chance. I'm going to still go with Southern, but I, I think Texas Southern have a chance. They, they got a little slip in them. But I'm going to go with Texas Southern. Gotcha. SU by 10, says Jimmy. So last one here, Arkansas Pine Bluff Prairie View. You rolling it. He just giving you points, spread, but you calling it. So you in line with all this. Last one, Arkansas Pine Bluff Golden Lions at Prairie View A&M Panthers. Last home game for the season for Prairie View A&M. Does Golden Pine Bluff come in and ruin it for the Panthers or do the Panthers go out and style with the seniors? I say Panthers going to take it. Now, MIAC, you said you wanted to get a little love in the MIAC, so we're going to give you a chance for Howard. We're going to say it in the last because that's where you just most recently been, so I know you're quite familiar with these. But I'll give you the record, so it gives you some shake up a little bit. Some of these are not too far out. But let's go Morgan State, as you've been in that area, so you're familiar with uh, MIAC in a lot of ways. You you do your homework. Morgan State is 1-8 and eight overall, 1-5 and five in the conference, so they've struggled all year long. Delaware State as well is just 1-8 and eight as well, 1-8.